Today on Community Watch, we'll be talking with Gary Mitchum Reeves, who uh, is going to tell us a little bit about an event coming up and also some of the stories of, uh, of his past, which uh, so many folks have enjoyed listening to. So uh, stay with us. Community Watch starts now. Welcome to Community Watch. Uh, I know uh, all you Greg fans out there uh, will be disappointed that Greg couldn't join us today, uh, but I'm going to make it up to you by presenting probably one of our most popular guests ever, uh, Mr. Mitchum Reeves. Welcome to the show again. Well, thank you very much. It's good to see you again. Uh, you know, um, I haven't kept count, you know, but we um, we do have kind of a guest hall of fame. So I, you may be you may be reaching that uh, that level. Um, All right. That sounds cool. <laughs> well, um, I don't know if there are any folks out there who are unfamiliar with at least some part of your story. I, I have to say that uh, it is, I think, impossible to be familiar with your whole story because you are an endless fountain of stories. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just when I think I'm caught up, you throw some new ones at me. So uh, I know that uh, there is no one that, that knows everything, but uh, for those folks who are not as familiar with you, um, many, many Romans uh, have learned your story or part of your story through the uh, podcast Undisclosed, which uh, covered uh, the case of your um, being accused of and found guilty of murder and uh, spent some time in prison, uh, a murder which you have said from the beginning you did not commit. And um, much of the evidence presented on that podcast seems to support that story. Um, and then you began your own podcast um, titled Mitchum. Uh, where you tell a lot of stories, not only about that same case that was covered with, and undisclosed, but other aspects of your life, including uh, some of your adventures in the bootlegging world. Uh, so, so uh, and th those podcasts are still out there, still available. If you have not uh, uh, heard any of them, uh, you really are missing something. Um, the Mitchum podcast in particular, um, mainly because uh, you are a great storyteller. I mean, there's just no question about it. I appreciate it. I found, uh, I guess I found my niche. <laughs> <laughs> Took a long time. <laughs> well, uh, it, it may be one of several niches that you have, but it certainly is one uh, for sure. And um, in fact, you have an event coming up in Rome where people can uh, hear some of that storytelling in person. Uh, and it is uh, on the 9th of September, I believe. Yes. Uh, that evening at the uh, History Museum, uh, in that upstairs area of the History Museum. Uh, and it is part of a uh, program and presentation that the History Museum has put together called Notorious Nights. Uh, some folks uh, 
listening may have been among those who were in attendance during the opening of that display, which I was very impressed with, and you were there. Um, so if you know, folks want to know more about the making of moonshine and the bootlegging world, I mean, it is all on display there still at the History Museum. I enjoyed that. So um, talking about that display, um, there were a lot of elements there that I did not uh, realize were involved, but um, the making of moonshine is no simple process. No, it's not. It was hard work for those guys, yeah. uh, especially having, having to do it in the woods. And they always had to get find a place close to water, uh, but yet far enough away from the roads. Uh, very interesting line of work. Your experience, though, was not in the actual making of moonshine, but in, in the uh, distribution area. Transport, transporting. Yeah, I think they would call that logistics now. Would they? I, I think maybe, maybe they would. Maybe that's, yeah. Um, but that was, uh, that was your particular uh, connection. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that. I, of course, when you learn how to drive a car when you're about four years old, <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, I think really I was probably 10 years old. Uh, when my brother started teaching me how to drive those three on the tree, they call it three on the tree now, straight shift boards uh, on those back roads. And uh, I would help them when he, one of my brothers would come in with a little liquor, then he'd stop by and get me and I'd help them on the stash. Uh, and then they turn me loose into uh, delivering uh, locally. A lot of local, <laughs> city, county, all over the place. Uh, and and, and the, the reason for that was the, the police knew my brother pretty well. Uh, they didn't know me yet. Didn't take long. <laughs> <laughs> they got to know me. Oh, uh, yes, that was some wild times. Well, I believe... Um those experiences and, and, and uh, a number of your experiences will be part of what you will talk about on September 9th at this event. Um, and I'm going to uh, do my best to help you out with that, uh, with that event. And uh, Thank you, brother. <laughs> This is my first in-person debut. <laughs> it's one thing sitting on your porch telling stories, but then when you're in front of an audience, it's, it's going to be interesting. Uh, and I know uh, uh, there are still uh, tickets available. Uh, folks need to go to the Rome History Museum um, website or in person, I guess, to get the details. Um, about those tickets, and there's still some available, but uh, some, quite a few have been sold, and so uh, it should be a very entertaining evening of uh, stories of, of what Rome used to be like. And uh, my 54 is going to be sitting out front, loaded with mason jars. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it It'll be worth it just to see that uh, beautiful car. And, you know, that's one recurring theme in your stories is that uh, the cars always play an important role. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I've always been impressed that you've been able to uh, kind of identify uh, in, in these memories that they really quite a few years ago. Uh, the cars are are re, are characters uh, in those stories. Yeah, the uh, cars will help trigger memories that I had, and I had so many cars. You know, you had to change automobiles pretty often. Mm -hmm. uh, 
especially when you're in a chase and the hood flies off one and lands at the brothels of the town's front door. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the stories that we did. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that 53 Buick had a, had a sad end. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but I, I, I think that may be a story uh, perfect for the event on, on the ninth. So that, that happened in Rome, you know, a, a lot of the, a lot of the stories. I think that's what we're doing mostly is the, the Rome stories. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, from listening to you already, we, we know that um, in those years, Rome was a, a much different place, a much wilder place than it is now. Well, yeah, the, the undercurrent that was taking place here and all the players involved, of course, most of them are passed on, but uh, it was, they were well connected, that was for sure. Well, we had talked uh, previously about, uh, because you did serve time for this, uh, this murder and um, where you are now is not, uh, that was one of the unique things about the undisclosed presentation is that they typically tell stories uh, or, or present cases of individuals who are still serving time for a, a crime that, you know, there's good evidence they did not commit. Uh, that, that's uh, what Undisclosed seems to specialize in. But yes. your case was a little different because you had already been released. You had already served the time that, that you were to serve. And uh, at this point, you just want to clear your name. You just want to, uh, it, it to be official that you were not guilty of that crime. Uh, and so Undisclosed presented that, that story from that, from that angle, which was a little different than most of their cases. And they discovered the, who really did the murder. Uh, that was amazing thing. We, we learned through undisclosed things that I didn't know for all these years when they, they discovered the, uh, the person who did the murder, why he did it, and how he did it. And uh, that was really an amazing thing for us. So, no, I won't go away. I think that's what <laughs> I just refuse to go away. You, people say, well, you did the time, you're out, you got a life. It's, uh, I ain't over it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's still bothers. It's a burr in my saddle, let me put it that way. So uh, being able to share that, undisclose what they did. And then when uh, Rob Gogi and Allison Van Noor from Los Angeles uh, decided to produce the Mitchum podcast, gave me an opportunity to tell a lot of things I've been able, unable to tell. And it's also, it was, it was therapy for me. I enjoyed the, being able to share those stories. Well, uh, we just have a little time left before our break. So uh, when we get back, I wanna um, hear some of those prison stories because I mean that, especially if uh, you were innocent of that crime, those experiences uh, are, uh, it makes sense why it would stick with you. And I'll uh, tell you. So uh, we are about to take a, uh, a break here, but we'll be back with Mitchum Reeves right after this short message. So don't go away. I know you've had your moments of doubt and struggle and I'm here to say I'm proud of you. And although each one of us may take a different path, may we look back upon today as the moment we stepped into a larger world, a greater world. You will pass this way but once. Do it right. 
If ever there was a time to follow your passion and do something that matters to you, now is certainly that time. Welcome back to Community Watch. And we're having a conversation with Gary Mitchum Reeves. And uh, uh, again, one of, one of our uh, recent regulars to the show. Um, we talked about, uh, on, a, on a previous show, you told us a little bit of, of the details about staying in the uh, local jail for, for a time. But you spent a number of years in, in prison, and I know some of your stories, some of this came out in, in the Undisclosed podcast, but uh, quite a few of your Mitchum episodes uh, covered, covered those times. Uh, so I, you know, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, so you you spent after you left Rome, you spent time in two was it two different prisons? Three. Three. Yeah. Yeah. You first go to uh well when they came and picked me up at Floyd County Jail, uh, you go to Jackson. That's the diagnostic center. Um and that's where they figure where what your trades are, where they can use you in the prison system. This was 1975. And uh, I, I wasn't in a good mood when I got there. So I probably had an icoptin attitude with the guy. That was a bad mistake. He asked me what kind of work I did. I said, well, I, I ran beer joints. I ran liquor and moonshine, ran a liquor store. And he said, well, we don't have any openings for any of that. So uh, you're <laughs> going to be <laughs> Uh, so they figured I didn't have a truck, but I could drive a truck. I, I drove a truck to Detroit many times loaded with liquor. Uh, I wish I'd have told him that. Maybe they could have used me somewhere driving a truck. So I, anyway, from Jackson, uh, then you, I went to Reachville. Well, that was a, a dread. It was a horror story. It's 1975. Uh, I mean, they had riots. Uh, it was a terrible hell on earth. Uh, so there's two old boys with me that was in Jackson, and we put us on the same bus called the Bluebird bus. And uh, so when you get there, they call the place the White Elephant, a uh, big white building. Uh, it could crush you. So you go through the rotunda, and then they send you through whatever dormitory you're going to go to. Well, they had just integrated at that time, 75. So they put me and the two boys, uh, both of them were named Ed. It was Ed and his brother, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we get introduced in the dormitory and the, the prisoners then ran the dormitory. I mean, the guards, they, they, they wouldn't go in there. They didn't want to go in there and listen. They'd have to bring a whole bunch of other guards if they had to go in there for any reason. So the, the house man uh, introduced himself and he said, uh, if you guys want to fight, go ahead and call the guard now, get, catch another dormitory. And he raised his mattress and there under his mattress was shank, iron pipes. And he said, uh, this, will, this will take care of you. And if it don't, I blow the, he wore a whistle around his neck and a whistle would blow the whistle for the guard. So he had an assistant that worked with him. And uh, <laughs> this assistant was a little short guy. Uh, and he was, his, uh, he'd been shot in the head with a 357 by a policeman in Lille. And so he had an iron plate in his head. So his nickname was Ironhead. And uh, Ironhead, he didn't need a shank. He didn't need a knife. He, all he needed was his head. Because if he hit you with his head, he, that's how he would fight was with his head. But he, he was a cool guy. I got I liked old Iron Kid. We got the we got to be friends. And uh, you go out on a dormitory. I mean, you go out on a, uh, a detail. You have to go out 
and work outside when you get there for six months uh, on a detail. Well, I'd been in jail since August of 74, and this was like April of 75. And man, I hadn't seen no sun, and I was pale. Ironhead said I was the whitest white man he ever saw. <laughs> I was pale. And uh, so you put out there in the, in the heat, and I never really cared for South Georgia too much. Uh, I mean, I like the mountains, but any chance of me ever liking it at all died in Reedsville, man. I mean, <laughs> it was, uh, if you ever see the movie, uh, The Longest Yard with Burt Reynolds, well, it was filmed, the exterior scenes was filmed on location. And they had filmed that movie right before I got there. Uh, I, I, I didn't get to see the movie until I got out of prison. So that's when you're introduced to your, uh, uh, you go out on the detail and uh, you have a number. So you're no longer, your name, forget it, you're a number from then on. And when you lined up in pairs every morning by the fence, the guard would come by and call your number. You'd say, check it, check it. Uh, then he would put you between the, uh, you go between the, fences and uh, the barbed wire over the fence and the gun towers and you could see where the riots had taken place and they had shot the windows out of the cannery. Um, so here I go on detail and uh, man I mean I'm weak and I could plus man I got an end row and told me and I couldn't hardly walk. So uh, everybody gets a nickname if they like you, if they accept you. So I'm thinking, well, what kind of nickname are these old boys going to give me? White Lightning, Moonshine Runner. You know, I'm thinking of something pretty cool. So the guard makes me go in and, and go to the hospital to get that indro and toenail taken care of. And, and uh, they took care of it. Uh, the, the free world doctor wasn't there, so a couple of inmates just jerked it off with some pliers. And, uh, Man, so then I couldn't I couldn't hardly walk with the toenail. Then I couldn't hardly walk with when they took it off. But had to go back out on detail. And uh, so the nickname I got <laughs> was Toe. <laughs> I said, man, but because of the situation, that was the. But, but again. Uh, if you got a nickname, that meant you fit in pretty well. So I fit in pretty well because I, growing up the way I did, and, I, you know, street smarts helped me survive. So when you, when you say detail, what were you assigned to do? Dig stumps in the swamps. You go out in the field and where they cut trees down, the, uh, the stumps were still there, so they put a couple of guys digging a stump. Well, when the first of all, when they carried you out to work, uh, you were on a on a on a bus with the seats off, so you it was packed. You was nose to nose with the guy. Well, then the walking boss he rode up front with the driver. Then the other guards were behind you in a pickup truck. One had a machine gun and one had a shotgun. And uh, then whenever you get out to wherever you're going to work in the swamps or in the fields or wherever, uh, they were your guards. So uh, actually, once I got in shape, I kind of I kind of liked being outside once I got used to it. And especially when you're digging a stump, you get it almost you get start digging while well, you're in water before you know it. Well, one, we didn't want to start on another stump. So if the stump was about to fall over, one of us would kind of hold it up while the other one would look busy. <laughs> so we could finish the day out on that one and not have to start on you. That was the kind of stuff we did. Uh, uh, cleaning a canal, I guess the worst day I had was uh, working in that canal, uh, water up your waist. And uh, the four snakes that I don't like were there. Big ones, little ones, dead ones, and live ones. They were all in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I stayed, uh, I was eligible to transfer on a different job after six months. 
Well, I chose to stay an extra month because I knew there was a house orderly job coming up. And uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to work in the mess hall for sure. And I didn't want to build, t- make tags. So I, I stayed out there an extra month to get that house or the job. Well, Ironhead and the other guy that ran the place, they, they put a word in for me and I got a house or the job. Now, the good part about that was uh, once the details would get out and one of the worst things in prison was the noise. Uh, but once the details were gone, it was quiet, man. I mean, just quiet. And uh, of course, the first day I got there, I saw a man die. And then I saw a man stab another guy, right? That almost killed him. So that kind of stuff was subject to happening any moment, any time. Uh, it was just a, a powder keg. Uh, but again, being able to get that house early job after the details went out, then you had some quiet time, which I did a lot of reading. So uh, what was the circumstance where you moved from Reedsville to the to the third location? Was that uh, something well, there's, you had any there's, control over or? Well, uh, I was supposed to be there five years before I was eligible for a transfer with a life sentence. And uh, my sister would write a letter and say, put in for a transfer, do it as an act of faith. <laughs> Grief, I can't get a transfer, but I, I would do it and they would deny it. Uh, the only way you could get a transfer was if a warden from another prison was requesting you. And so there was a guy from Rome came through there and uh, I kind of, I knew this boy, this guy wasn't going to survive reasonable if somebody didn't give him some advice. And I did my best to do that and kind of showed him, uh, don't do this or here's how you do and whatever. And uh, he, there's more story to that, but he, uh, he ended up getting transferred to Carroll County. I don't, I had no clue where he was going. And so he, the warden there was uh, requesting me from Carroll County, but the warden didn't know it. This old boy ended up going to Carroll County and he was the warden's secretary. So my sister, he got in touch with my sister and they, he started sending letters to prison, reasonable to the warden there requesting me. Uh, and so one day I get, a, I get a notice, you shipping out of here in the morning. It was, I'd been there about a year, oh. uh, went to Carroll County through the help of this guy and uh, my sister, and then it's been known to the warden that he was requested. Mm. That's a lot of stories about Carroll County, I can <laughs> tell you, but we don't have time. <laughs> no, in fact, we, we have just under a minute, believe it or not. Um, but I know that you tell a lot of these stories uh, on the podcast. Yes. And um, they're, they're really some, uh, some amazing ones. Um, so uh, for folks uh, who haven't yet heard them, I mean, I'll uh, direct you to the, the Mitchum podcast uh, as soon, soon as you can get there to, to hear some of these. And also to remind you that the event coming up on September 9th, uh, still have tickets available there at the Rome History Museum. Well, I want to thank you once again uh, for being with us and uh, telling us a few stories, and I'm sure we'll have you back again soon. Uh, And uh, those of you watching, thank you for, for being with us on Community Watch. We will see you next time.